my mic's on. Okay. All right. So I just want to tell you before I get into God's word, and, and, and some of you know this because you were here last year when I was here speaking, um, I want to give you a heads up. I'm not going to speak to you like your children, okay? Here's the cool thing. Here's the interesting thing about teenagers is that, and this is not a, 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 a bad statement. It's just a true statement. Teenagers tend to act like children but want to be respected and treated like adults. It's not a bad statement. It's just true. You, you guys have not grown into the maturity of adulthood. Therefore, you still act like children. But the things going on inside of you, the things going on from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep are so deep and heavy that it actually the, it brings me to tears five seconds into my speaking because I'm so aware of the things that go on in your hearts. And those are very adult matters. They're very adult issues. They're very serious. And they have, some of them, life and death consequences. And so, when we, this is the cool thing about camp. We can act like children all day and play and have fun and just wrestle around with each other and do whatever you guys do. But we can come to this time and we can get serious. And we can be not boys and girls, but men and women. And so I'm going to give you that respect. I know you guys want that respect. I respect you that way. I'm going to talk to you like young men and young women. And I'm going to talk to you from someone, as someone that has a broken heart for you and your generation. I love you guys. My, my own children are just a few years older than you, 19, 21, and 23. I'm very familiar with the burdens of your generation. I'm very, very familiar with the burdens of your generation. I dealt with them in my own home just in the last handful of years. And my heart is heavy for you guys. You guys are being raised without a sense of purpose. You guys are being raised without any message of hope. Like, and I say hope, I mean something to cling to, something you can hold on to, something you can wake up with, walk throughout your day with, go to bed with, and know that you have something worth hanging on to that will never let you down. You guys aren't being given that in your generation, not just from the schools and the media, but even in your own homes, some of you, many of you. I understand your brokenness, and I'm broken for you. I speak to you as, yeah, in one sense, I'm a stranger. Some of you haven't spoken. I, we haven't spoken one word to each other. I don't even know your name. My name's Smiles if you haven't gotten it. But I, I also speak to you like a father. I love you like you're my own children. And I know that might be hard, to you, hard for you to believe and maybe even hard for you to even want to accept because your understanding of fatherhood, might, you might not understand what I mean. And I, I'm cool with that, but I love you. So I'm going to speak to you like your young women, young men that I love, like you're my own children. And secondly, before we get into the word... I want to let you know that I am keenly aware. I've been this close to death so many times, whether it be from my own hands, tying a noose, ready to hang myself from a tree, or by car accident, a couple really bad car I've been this close to death so many times. And God has spared my life time and time and time again to bring me so far to this place today. But... In those experiences, I have come to realize that I can't take this breath for granted. I'm not promised another. I, and, and, and I want you to get that too. I was just walking through a graveyard the other day at my church in southeast Ohio. And 
I just, I don't know why I was doing it, honestly. I'm walking through this graveyard, and I'm reading the gravestones one after another, just walking in a straight line. And in that whole line was six gravestones, and I counted up the years, and the total of those six lives was less than 90 years. You know what that average is out? 15 years per life. That's amazing. We have no idea how much time we have. We have, and I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that this is just a reality. Like, here we are. We're alive today. Praise God. We have life right now. Take a breath. Just pause. Take a breath. I realize that some of you might not even want to be here. But you are blessed to be here and take that breath. And I don't want you to take it for granted. I don't take it for granted. I might not have another breath. And I might not be here the rest of this week. This might be my last opportunity to get up here and stand before you and share God's word with you. I, this is how I handle my preaching ministry. I preach. There's an old Puritan named uh, Richard Baxter. He said, I preach as a dying man unto dying men. I might never have an opportunity to share Christ with you again, folks. So I'm not going to get up here this week, and I'm not going to be one of those guys that steps up to the plate and hits a bunch of singles throughout the week and tries to load the bases so that at the end of the week I can hit a big grand slam, you know, and a big giant altar call up front. I'm not that way, okay? I'm going to get up to the plate, and I'm going to swing for the fence every time. Okay, because this might be my last opportunity to proclaim the love of Christ to you. This might be your last opportunity to hear the love of Christ. Because we're not guaranteed another day. So the love of Christ. Oh, the love of Christ. The love of Christ has changed me. I spent 19 years of my life not having a clue about the love of God. No one told me if they did, I had no recollection. I wasn't raised being told about Jesus. I was raised under condemnation. I was raised lost as can be. <laughs> you know, at four o'clock today, I was out there on that basketball court and I said to a young lady, I said, what's your favorite thing about yourself? And she said something, and it was pretty cool. I'm not going to say what it was. And I turned to the lady next to her, and I said, what's your favorite thing about yourself? And she goes, nothing. That's a heavy thing. And I said, nothing? And she's like, no, I don't like anything about myself. That's a heavy thing. And I didn't want to respond too quickly so I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. I didn't expect that. But here I am as someone that is here to lead and shepherd and care for this young lady. And I find myself in this situation. And you know what I said to her? I said, I bet you feel all alone in that, don't you? I bet when you feel like you're just worthless and terrible and there's, you, you look in the mirror and there's nothing at all that you like about yourself. I bet you feel like you're all alone in that, don't you? And she nodded her head. And I said, I want to tell you, so many of your peers around you feel the exact same way. You're not alone. You're not alone. These burdens that we bear in life, we bear together, even though we feel like we're alone. We're walking down this road together. I don't care what your upbringing is, whether you've been raised in the church, whether you've never heard, never ever, no one's ever opened a Bible and told you what it said. And when I just said the love of Christ and then the love of God and made it, this, no one's ever heard that Jesus is God. Some of, some of you guys have never heard this stuff. We all have a different background, but we're all in the same place in one re very real sense. In that same place is that we stand in the mirror and we stare into our eyeballs. And I mean stare into, into our eyeballs. I'm not talking about looking at your makeup. And there's things about us that if we're honest, we really can't stand. And we don't share those things out and about. 
None of you would raise your hand right now, probably, and say, oh, yeah, here's all those things about me. Pretty much none. I wouldn't do that to you for you. I'm not humble enough. I'm not honest enough with myself, actually. But I, I'm in the same boat with you. I stare into the mirror, and when I have the courage to stare into my eyeballs, there are things about me that I just can't stand. But there's another thing I see when I look into my eyeballs. I see the love of Christ who has set me free from all that I've done, from all that I am, from all that I will do. He has set me free from myself and he set me free to love. You wouldn't believe it, but I used to be the most hate hateful person you could ever meet. I was filled with rage and anger and lies and lust and, oh, man, the list goes on. But I would have hated you for something, if not many things, because that's who I was. But now I look into my eyeballs and I think about what Christ has done for me and I see that he set me free. He's forgiven me. And I want you guys all to come to that place. And you open the scripture to Romans chapter 8. And let me tell you, this book is not a joke. I walk up here earlier, and one of the kids bring, opens up this treasure box, and he's like, look, there's a holy Bible in it. This is just 20 minutes ago. And I was like, that is a holy Bible. And Ben said, some of the greatest treasure or something Something like that. Great, the greatest treasure. This book is the greatest treasure. I used to hate this book. I used to hate Christians. I used to hate Jesus. I used to hate pastors. And look at who he's made me to be. <laughs> There's nothing I love more than this book. There's nothing I love. There's, there's no greater message than the words in this book. And I open it up. And I open it up and I turn to my fate, what happens to be my favorite book, which is Romans. If you don't know where Romans is, it is this far in. There's the beginning, there's the end. Okay? You can't find it that you have a um, New Testament. I mean, uh, 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 yeah, you have a, uh, come on, what's the thing up front? The table of contents, thank you. It's in the New Testament. And in Romans chapter 8, this is what we see. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a profound statement that doesn't seem like fantastic news unless you understand the bad news that it implies. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, here's what's interesting, and here's why it's hard to read the scripture sometimes, and even the best words and the best news in it, because the best news, the good news, that's what gospel means, the gospel, the good news implies that there's bad news, okay? So this is hard, and this is really hard, and this is, when I heard that about that girl saying there's nothing I like about me, my first response when they walked away was to come here and sit in that chair where Logan is and weep, realizing how fragile your hearts are and realizing how hard this message is at the beginning <laughs> and how hard it will be for me to say these things to you knowing how fragile and broken you already are. But I want you to stick with me because this is not a message about condemnation. This is, about, this is a message about no condemnation in Christ. Okay? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that implies? And you're not going to like this. What it implies is there is therefore now condemnation for those who are not in Christ Jesus. That's what it implies. 
Now, when I was 13 years old and I went to summer camp because my mom was desperate and tried to get rid of me and have the camp fix me, the, the guy opened the Bible and he told me lots of good news. And all he said in his good news was that basically like Jesus is great. He'll make your life better. And that's true. But I needed to know the bad news. I needed to know that I needed him. And I, I was never taught that I needed him. And why did I need him? Because we have these things in our life, and it's called sin. Those are the things where you look in the mirror, and you see, and you're honest with yourself, and you look in your eyeballs, what you see that you just can't stand. That's the sin in your life. I'm not going to try to point it out, what it is for you. You know. You know. And our sin alienates us from God. Why does it alienate us from God? It alienates us from God because there's no sin in God. And one of the amazing things about God is he loves his children. He loves his people. And and, 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 and. If you go to Romans 1, 2, 3, you'll see this. It's filled with bad news. The first part of Romans is really hard to read. You will see that our hearts are set against him. And our passions are against him. And our lusts are impure. And, and God, because he loves us, he says, Child, if that's what you want, have it. There's going to be consequences. And it's going to hurt. And my heart will be breaking while you're wandering away from me. But if that's what you want, you have your way. That, that right there alienates us from God. And it's not his wrongdoing. It's our wrongdoing. And here's what's amazing about the Lord. And I'll tell you. I'll tell you, I, I know this. Do you know what he does? He pursues, he pursues the children that he loves. And he knows your name, and he knows right where, right where you're at in your muck and mire. And he knows your wandering, he knows your pain, he knows your sin. And he pursues you. And he keeps calling you by name. And he keeps calling you by name. And he says, here I am, come to me. Here I am, come to me. That is the heart of Christ. And here's what's crazy. We still don't come even though his heart is what it is towards us. We still don't come. And we, we choose burden rather than blessing. We choose death rather than life. And we actually condemn God and get mad at him because we're miserable. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So how do you pass from, not, from, from being in condemnation... How do you pass from that to no condemnation? Well, something has to be done about our sin. See, God is a just God. Justice must take place. Justice must take place. And justice for our sin doesn't look good, folks. The wrath of a holy God towards our sin is not a good picture for us. Eternally separated from God. But you have the heart of God. And here's what he does. And I'm not going to go into all the scriptures. I don't have time. I, we're going to talk about this all week long. You have the heart of God pursuing his children. And he comes in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. God, almighty God, uncreated, eternal, righteous, perfect, holy God. Creator of all things. Humbles himself. Takes on flesh. In, he, be, he becomes a bond servant. He's a servant of God. He's the only person that walks in the flesh. 
And he's tempted in every single way that you are tempted to sin. Yet, the scripture says, he had no sin. And he comes and he takes on flesh. And he says, he, he says Father, I will obey you all the way to death. And Jesus didn't come just to tell us what to do on earth. He didn't come just to feed the poor. He didn't come just, just to uh, heal people that had withered hands and diseases. He didn't come just to do that. Yes, he did that. All that was a demonstration of his power. That's not why he came. He didn't come to just teach us little life lessons. He came to be a sacrifice for your sin. Jesus Christ came to die. Jesus Christ came to die in our place. And that's exactly what he did. The sinless Jesus Christ, the sinless God in the flesh, walked this earth and his own people rejected him and put him on a cross. Actually cried out to the authorities saying, crucify him, crucify him. He says he's God. He says he's our God. He's blaspheming. Crucify him. Kill him. And that's exactly what happened. We have Jesus Christ on the cross taking all of God's justice, all of God's wrath, all of God's anger, fierce anger. God hates sin. He loves people. And he proved it on the cross, but he hates sin, and it must be dealt with. And when Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross, folks, what was happening is the justice of God for my sin and your sin is being poured out on him, and he does it willfully. He does it willingly. He does it not because he has to, but because he loves his children and when the wrath of God is poured out upon Christ, and we look upon Christ, the scripture says, with faith, with trust, and we say, I trust that sacrifice. I trust you. I look upon you, and what you did, your righteousness, is sufficient for me. And when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, he says these words. And I want to ask you, do you trust, do you trust the power of these words? He looks down and he says, he looks down at people like you and I who were crucifying Christ. And he says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. If you and I were there, we would have had no clue what was taking place on the cross. But now I tell you, I proclaim to you, what was taking place is Jesus Christ was taking our sin off of us and placing it onto himself. And crying out to his father, Father, forgive them. He came to forgive. He didn't come to condemn if, he was, if God wanted to condemn us, he would have left us to ourselves because we were good enough at doing that ourselves. We didn't need God to condemn us. We were good enough at doing that ourselves. What we need is a God that forgives. And what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be not condemned, Romans 8.1, what it means to be in Christ is to trust Christ. Not to do all the right things to please him. That's not freedom. We're going to talk about freedom tomorrow. Not to do all the good things and jump through the right hoops so that hopefully we can stand before him one day and he'll be like, yeah, you were good enough for me. No, that's not what it's about. It's about trusting his righteousness and not looking unto our own. This is freedom. This is forgiveness. This is life. There's so much condemnation in the world that you guys deal with. There's just condemnation, 
and I just told you about that, and Jesus Christ dealt with that, and then there's lots of unjust condemnation. It's not right that you're condemning yourself. It's not right that you're condemning others. It's not right, it's not just that others are condemning you. There's all, you guys are dealing with condemnation after condemnation after condemnation. And Jesus Christ came to deal with all that condemnation. And you have to start with the just condemnation that was placed on Christ. Set the other unjust condemnation aside for a minute and deal, what is, deal with what is real and what is just so that you can stand justified before your God. It says when, we, when, we, when, we, when we're in Christ, we stand justified. We don't stand condemned. We stand justified. And Romans 3 says that, when, that we're justified with God. We have peace with God when we're justified. We have peace with God. That's an amazing statement, folks. I mean, can you say you have peace with God? Can you look in the, your eyeballs in the mirror and say, I have peace with God? Yes, I see sin. Yes, I see sin, but I have peace with God because of what he's done for me on the cross. And I am not condemned because he came to bear the wrath and to forgive. Can you say that? Can you say that? You need to be able to say that. You need to be able to say that. I can't bring you to a place of saying that. That's, that's between you and God. My job is to proclaim the gospel. Once that condemnation is dealt with in your life, the condemnation of your own sin, and you see Christ on the cross, and you trust that that's where the condemnation belongs and not on yourself because he's a gracious God that loves you, once that condemnation is dealt with, then none of the other condemnation can stick because people can say whatever they want about you and you can say, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Maybe you're right about that, but I'm forgiven. You know what? Big deal. Say what you want. You can say the worst things. Jesus Christ died to forgive me. You know what? You can accuse me of whatever, true or untrue, it doesn't matter. I stand justified before God Almighty and I have peace with him. Go ahead and condemn me. It's not going to stick. Dealing with condemnation at the right place first is so important, folks, because you need to know that you have peace with God before you can have peace with yourself and peace with your fellow man or woman. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is a, this is a no condemnation message. I've been walking in this message for 25 years. I've been walking in this life for 25 years. I think tomorrow morning I'm going to share my wife's story with you. Her story of redemption. Her story of understanding condemnation like I never really had to deal with it personally. And I'll, I'll walk you down her road a little bit as we look at redemption, what that means. It's a word some of you might not even know, but that's tomorrow morning. I've been walking down this road for 25 years. And you know what? I'll tell you what. Walking down the road, as a, walking down the road of life as a Christian is not the easy road. But, man, it's the life of hope and peace and freedom and forgiveness and joy and strength. And it's just life. I once tried, once, I kept trying to kill myself, and I wanted to kill others, and now all I want to do is breathe life. Jesus Christ has changed me, and he's calling you to do the same thing that he called me to do 25 years ago, and calls me to every single breath, and that calling is, little child, come to me. Come to me. So, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? But to Christ. What's our only option? Where do we go from here? But to the Lord. What's our, own, what's, what's our option? Because you're either going to remain in your sin and remain dead, remain in condemnation, or you're going to actually go somewhere. 
And that's to Christ on the cross. And you're going to look to him with gratitude and humility and honesty and praise. And let him raise you up unto life and hear him say, come to me. Hear him say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Come to Christ while you can and be forgiven and be free. Amen.